uh, let's in, in order to ensure, ensure the smooth proceedings of the session we request you to ensure that uh, your video and audio are off please let us know about your queries through the chat box and uh, if any of you find any technical issues in logging in uh, please feel free to reach out to uh, ms lakshmi her mail id and number are given in the correspondence email thank you By the time, uh, let us introduce you to the Department of Commerce. The Department of Commerce was established in 1985 as a teaching and research department of the University of Kerala. Within 36 years, we were able to establish ourselves as a center of excellence with a focus on, on education, research, consultancy and extension services. Currently, the department offers MCOM Finance, MCOM Global Business Operations, MPhil, PhD and postdoctoral fellowship programs with specialization in finance, marketing, accounting and human resource management. The department has its own researchers forum and academic body of researchers. The forum brings out the journal entitled Commerce and Business Research. We are delighted to have all of you with us. Together, let's make this a successful endeavor. Thank you. The Associate Professor from the University of Wollongong, Dubai, Dr. Vikas Ramaya, renowned for his works in applied economics. He is an expert in the international financial management and financial strategy. After the inaugural ceremony, we will have the first technical session where Dr. Vikas will be talking on emerging research in equity and derivatives market, trade extreme portfolio selection. We welcome you to the I'm late. Can you guys hear me? Question, sir. Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? Warm welcome, yeah, sir. Warm yeah, welcome, yeah. warm welcome. Yes, yes, we can, we can. Yes, sir. We can hear you. Yeah, research uh, tools and publications organized by the Department of Commerce, School of Business Management and Legal Studies, University of Kerala. The workshop aims at introducing scholars, faculties, and researchers to the recent research in finance and predominantly look into contemporary emerging financial research. The content is designed to cover several areas of finance, such as behavioral finance, trading strategies, fund management, new derivative products, working capital management, corporate governance, environmental finance, health finance, sustainable finance, fintech, and international finance. Through this conference, we hope to discuss and discover new research areas and help one another to identify upcoming topics of prime relevance. Thank you. Mind you once again, uh, to ensure the smooth proceedings of the session, uh, please make sure that your video and audio are off. Please let us know about your queries through the chat box. And if you find any technical issues in logging in, we repeat, please reach out to Ms. Lakshmi. Her mail ID and number are given in the correspondence mail. We request our most valued professor, Dr. G. Raju, professor and head, Department of Commerce, University of Kerala, to welcome the gathering. Good evening and warm welcome to all of you 
to this 10 day international workshop and conference 2021 on contemporary finance research tools and publication is workshop come conference organized by department of commerce university of kerala my dear friends university of kerala is one of the oldest universities in india we started in the year 1937 before independence in the university Presently, we have about 43 departments, and Department of Commerce is one among the 43 departments. And as compared to other departments, this department is young in the sense that the department started only in the year 1985. Over a period of 36 years, the department has established in all its levels, in its teaching, research, consultancy, and extension work, and the department has made considerable progress in all these areas it is clearly evident from the fact that over a period of 36 years the department has produced 358 phds and presently in addition to this 358 phds around 400 scholars are doing research in commerce along with the research activities the department of commerce is well known for its extension activities consultancy and teaching activities in the sense that the department started in the year 1985 with mcom mphil and phd and presently the department offers three mcom programs mcom finance and accounting mcom global business operation then mcom rural management along with this mphil phd and pdf program so that is the noticeable achievement made by the department of commerce in teaching in extension and consultancy work also the department has shown its own uh, ability by taking projects of world bank uh, then uh, gian program the department organized gian programs and the department is committed to the society in the sense that the department is taking continuous classes uh, in village level for the school children and uh, recently the department had made an mou with one of the schools for uh, uh, for making a thorough interaction as well as for interaction with the uh, school children and all these things so department is known in almost all the activities and in that series the department has as i told that in research also the department is well known it has organized a large number of seminars international conference and all those things uh, in that series this is the latest one that is a 10-day international workshop and conference and here we are discussing contemporary finance research tools and publications even though this large number of phds are being produced by the department still some of our students find it difficult to identify the appropriate tools and they are seeking the help of external faculty as well as external members in identifying the tools of course all the phd scholars have studied the a research methodology in depth as well as they know almost all the tools and they know the publication rules but still they find some difficulty in choosing the appropriate tools and choosing the correct journal for its publication and the purpose of this seminar is to give an uh, to give a finishing touch to the scholars who are currently doing research in identifying the appropriate tools as well as to have the right publications not only the uh, regional publications and they should aim at through this workshop uh, of course all the scholars and all those who are assembled or those who are, are joining for this program will get a clear idea about where they have to publish their articles to get a wide publicity and acceptance and that is the purpose of this seminar and for that we have organized a 10-day program as all of you know that uh, today is the inaugural session and immediately after the inaugural session one technical session is being handled by our own uh, uh, our uh, uh, invited resource person who is going to inaugurate this program then tomorrow also he will be handling a session and day after tomorrow our own faculty dr p n harigumar will discuss about the time series data of course majority of the research in commerce are presently done with the help of primary data but the second data are also equally relevant and for the second data time series data is of utmost importance our own faculty dr p n harigumar will discuss about the 
time series data and day after tomorrow that is on 25th professor sandosh kumar of kuzad will explain the road map for finance research nowadays the trend that uh, uh, we can see in commerce that most of the research are uh, some uh, socially relevant topics some uh, some so social or relevant that is uh, which are some of them are keeping away from commerce studies and the object of that session is to identify some of the areas in finance itself so that the commerce scholars can do research in finance and related studies the day after uh, thursday issues in international trade will be discussed by dr rama arun kumar of isdid new delhi then the next day extraction and use of nss data for social science as i told that most of our studies are on primary data but the secondary data are, are also equally important a lot of secondary sources are available in uh, this national sample survey organization cmi report and all these things and that will be enlightened by dr indrajit of isc bangalore again uh, this uh, dr sabuj kumar mandal of iit madras will explain about the use of stat statistics and data and how the statistics and data or in data how statistics can be applied in qualitative studies related to equity debt and other choices of finance will be discussed by dr sabuja kumar he will handle one more session on on the 31st of uh, this month and again other one of the faculty members of our own department dr gabriel simon tattil will explain about the integrated financial market and emerging research perspectives and what are the research topics in integrated financial market and and he will explain about that topic as well as the appropriate tools for making a study related to that one this is the time schedule along with that we have a conference day 23 2020 2021 20, sunday is exclusively devoted for conference and in that day three uh, technical sessions will be simultaneously handled and uh the participants as well as other invited people can make paper presentations so this is the complete schedule of this 10 day program uh, and without wasting your time i am sure that all of you are eager to hear from our uh international resource person dr vikas ramaya so without wasting your time as well as the time of other scholars i am entering to my assigned task of welcoming all of you dear friends as all of you know uh, today's session is being chaired by professor dr gabriel simon tattil no need of introduction about dr gabriel simon tattil among the faculty members or among the faculty of this commerce among the faculty home of commerce because almost all of you are in one way or other way knows about dr simon personally he is the professor as well as he is the director of the school of business management and legal studies even though i had told that there are 43 department these 43 departments are merged into 11 schools and he is the director of that school in addition uh, he is the director aqsc of university of kerala being a person with multiple talent as well as multiple responsibilities he is discharging all those duties and he is a uh, proud of the department of commerce so uh, without wasting any more explanation uh, with the permission of all the people assembled here i express a warm welcome to professor gabriel uh, simon tattil for chairing this inaugural session warm welcome sir to this inaugural session then i welcome our key resource person is none other than dr vikas ramia he is a faculty of the university of ulangog dubai don't misunderstand that this is a university of dubai uh, this is a university this university of ulangog is a famous public university in south australia maybe his campus is located at dubai and he is presently working there in dubai as far as vigas ramaya is concerned presently his designation is associate professor of finance of this university of ulangog but he is associated with so many universities in different capacities so many universities in different capacities in the sense that for teaching research uh then uh, this research fellowship and this multiple jobs or this multiple positions he is having association with different universities as i told he is a faculty basically he is a faculty of ulangong university of south australia presently located at dubai then his 
teaching special his areas are economics and finance then he is teaching uh, not only in this university of bulangog unlike ours a faculty in foreign countries they can teach in different universities on different capacities so his teaching is uh, not only in uh, this bulangog universities in other universities like royal melbourne institute of technology latrobe university australian catholic university etc so in all these universities he may be handling classes then in addition to that like a university professor in kerala he is also guiding research students he has already produced phd's in finance economics and business related subjects then in addition to teaching he has a very good uh, interrelation or very good relation with the industry his industry experience is evident from his association with australia and new zealand banking group ans investment banking australian stock exchange finance and treasury association of australia australian center for financial studies etc these are the uh his experience in different uh, industries then he is a research fellow of the institute of global business society cologne university of applied sciences tianjin academy of environmental science professional research associate at victoria university adjunct professor at tondang tang university vietnam adjunct associate professor at unisa and professor at global humanistic university so from this before listening his words we have a good idea about the quality as well as what we are expecting from him anyway his specialization is applied finance and his research is also in areas related to financial market behavioral finance environmental and sustainable finance and maybe because of that he is handling two sessions today the emerging research in equity and derivatives market trading strategy and stream portfolio selection immediately after the inaugural function he will uh, go for that technical session and tomorrow also he will give a better understanding about the research design for behavioral finance some of our students even though they are well versed in uh, research methodology they find it difficult to uh, make a very good research design if a good research design is framed 50% of the work is over and he will give some good ideas about how to make a very good research design for behavioral finance and with this verse i just to say warm welcome to professor bigas ramaya for this inaugural session as well as for subsequent uh, technical session on this equity derivatives related uh, empirical research sir warm welcome to this our 10 day international workshop warm welcome to uh, professor bigas ramaya along with bigas professor bigas ramaya i also welcome our dean faculty of commerce dr asia bigam uh professor p n harigumar professor uh, biju t uh, miss lishmi mr vinu also for this inaugural session last but not the least i have to welcome biju av who is the coordinator as well as who is the brain for this kind of a program of course so many different uh, programs are being organized by the department of commerce as well as his affiliated college but he felt that there is a need to fine tune the research by identifying the appropriate tool in research and there is a need to have a right publication attitude among research scholars and maybe because of that he had identified this 10 day this topic for this 10 day a uh, workshop come conference so as a formality he is the coordinator and he is the brain and he is the uh soul of this program in we as a formality i also welcome biju av also uh, to this inaugural address and with these words i hand over the session to the organizers thank you thank you please thank you sir for the brief overview of the conference and introducing the dignity trees to all the delegates for the presidential address we invite dr gabriel simon tattil director school of business management and legal studies 
who is also the director of the Internal Quality Assurance Cell, University of Kerala. Thank you. Good evening, one and all. Uh, most respected head of the department, Professor G. Raju, our distinguished guest of the day, who is inaugurating as well as addressing us, not only today, on the subsequent sessions, Professor Vikas, Dean Faculty of Commerce, Professor Rasia, my colleagues, uh, all the scholars and students who have joined for this 10 day workshop, ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening. Now, at the outset, I extend a very, very warm welcome to Professor Vikas, who is joining us in the University of Kerala. Unfortunately, we are not face to face, but I'm sure over a period of 10 days, uh, his university and our university, the resources in him and the resource gaps in us would get bridged and uh, we would turn out to be more friendly. So a very warm welcome to Professor Vikas. I also extend a very warm welcome to all the delegates from outside Kerala or even outside India. I'm not sure because as I said, we are not uh, on, a, on, a, on a direct platform, so I believe there are delegates from other countries. Yes, sir. One person from UAE is there. Yeah, but we have somebody from UAE and we also have delegates from other parts of the country outside Kerala. Very warm welcome to all of you. And uh, let us come to what we are having in stock for us. Uh, we are here to discuss about research in finance. And I think this is very interesting, and this is something over which we need to have a very strong and firm understanding of what is actually happening with finance, what is actually happening in terms of uh, the financial market. Uh, I was, when I was invited for this presidential address, I was for a moment thinking on what was the kind of workshop which was taking place or what were the conferences and seminars which were taking place in finance when it comes to research or when it comes to hardcore learning on financial markets. When I was a student or when I just completed my master's maybe 35 years back. And interestingly, I'll, I, I'll start from there. In, and I think that these are the points over which we need to have our focus. We were looking at a market which was highly segmented and all theories relating to finance and research actually emerged from it. We were so Simon, sir, Simon, sir, yeah. uh, can you check your voice? Uh, voice? It's not, you're not hearing it? Okay. Yeah. Uh, is it now clear? Yeah, yeah. now it's okay. So please raise your voice. Was, That's it. Okay. Okay. So there was a, a, there was a financial market at that point of time, which was highly segmented and all forms of literature or all forms of uh, the theories that we had, it talked about a market which was segmented. So we used to discuss, yeah, we had the financial market, money market, the capital market, and we used to say, okay, the money market is a market for short term funds. Capital market is for the long term funds. And then you have your banks and financial institutions going into the uh, money market. Again, banks were segmented into like uh, agriculture banks, extreme banks, all kinds of banks. And in the capital market, again, we are talking about uh, the, 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 the new issues market and then the secondary market. It, it, these are all segmented kind of things which were happening. Insurance was one segment, mutual fund was another segment. So this was this was the kind of thing that we had at that point of time. But today, when you look at any institution or any service in the financial market, you see that it is cutting across all these boundaries. You have an institution which is present in banking, which is present in the DMAT segment, which does mutual fund business, which does uh, your insurance business. It's all interwoven. It's all integrated. So this is a big change which has actually happened. And we are all uh, doing this business in terms of the interface between investment, speculation, and savings. So this welcome change 
was by and large made possible by technology. And what happened in the if, if I if I if I was tracing 35 years, if you look at what happened in the last 10 or 15 years, the change has more dominated in terms of services like fintech services or blockchain. Or for that matter, we are today talking about virtual financial services, which are getting integrated on a digital space using all kinds of databases and financial models. This is where we stand. And we are in the phase of transition in the sense that a generation from which I come, or for that matter, many of those who finish or close their uh, masters, uh, maybe 15, 20 years back, they they have not received that kind of a, a inner uh, inner learning into this these concepts of financial modeling and how they get integrated into finance. So it is here that this workshop turns out to be uh, relevant, and I'm sure Professor Vikas is going to take us through this world of research in finance using hardcore financial models using the theories which are associated with using mathematical models, statistical models for analyzing the tons and tons of data which are available on the segments of equity and derivatives that you see, which are available in the segments of options and futures, uh, which you can see. And there are databases which is doing lots of uh, mathematical and statistical modeling in terms of identifying products, creating portfolios, hedging your risks, setting your limits, all these things are available for the investors of the financial market today. And this demands a lot of research into it. The, the amount of research that is being done by consulting firms in this regard is very huge. And that is evident from the constitution of the research teams when it comes to finance. Research teams with RBI, research teams with SEBI, research teams with firms in different financial services, even in policy-making bodies. But unfortunately, we are not seeing that kind of a movement or that kind of a flow into policy research, into research that is going to create this kind of a linkage where you're trying to use your financial models, your mathematical models to manage risk, to support edging, to create portfolios, to know how risk can be best managed when the market is volatile, to see the patterns and to see the developments which are coming up. There are, there, here we have tons and tons of data which is available in the secondary form for us, and we have a host of models into which we need to actually look into. And I'm sure the, these 10 days are going to be days where we are, in fact, going to ponder over these issues. You are going to come face to face with these issues. And great people like Professor Vikas is going to lead you on this line to see how you can use financial models, statistical models, databases, in order to look at this integrated market, which will perhaps operate without boundaries of time and space, which will perhaps operate in deep-rooted digital uh, platforms. So we might have, perhaps we might have banking services, but we, we might not even have a bank, which is a physical space in future. Uh, the, the way the capital market has changed, the stock exchanges has changed is so important. We no more have a, a space which is called a trading hall. We, we, we do not have a specific trading time uh, where you say that, okay, only, only at this point of time trading can take place. So it is very wide, it is very strong, and it is very integrated. So we need a kind of strong research going into that. One more point which I would like to clarify at this stage is how we need to be a bit multidisciplinary because uh, I am speaking from 
the Department of Commerce under the School of Business Management and Legal Studies. What is our face uh, or what is our actually face interaction with the Department of Economics or the branches of economics? Because uh, there is a lot of research which goes into that discipline. I still remember one of our own research scholars who was from the Department of Economics who used to be a frequent visitor to the Department of Commerce way back in 2004 to 2006. She completed her uh, PhD here and subsequently is heading a research team with SEBI. Uh, she used to talk about these issues, like uh, what we actually see in, in, at macroeconomic level, how you look at uh, fiscal policy and the relatedness of fiscal policy with capital markets, or what happens with FIIs and in the capital, what happens in the capital market, how does, how competent or how how efficient is the Indian domestic financial institution to match up or catch up with the foreign institutional investor? How acute are, are our individual investors to perhaps see that uh, they get avenues of investment which are very strong? Now, the COVID pandemic has brought in a digital penetration into the capital market where we have seen DMAT accounts uh, soaring up. The, the figures, it took almost 10, 10 years to reach the, the first crore mark, one crore mark for DMAT accounts. And, but then in the last uh, maybe 20 months, we have reached the three crore mark. So there is but still lots of space. There is a lot of room for expansion. There is, there is lots and lots of penetration to happen because of aversion, because of the absence of sound literacy into the tools through which we can penetrate into the capital market, into the derivative segment, into the equity segment, into the mutual fund segment. Now, this understanding can carry forward or can 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 gain momentum when we when we take it forward only when there is good research in that. And I think uh, much of this will be perhaps discussed, deliberated, and. Uh, there will be something useful which is coming up. We have a number of research scholars in our own department, and I'm sure many who have uh, who have registered or who are acting as delegates here would be people who are uh, doing research in some of the areas relating to equity derivatives, portfolio construction, uh, including your conventional William Sharp CAPM2 behavioral finance and carrying that forward. But then we need to understand that our research must never be let down by inhibitions which we hold or by the reluctance which we somewhere develop because of our, uh, what do you call, some kind of a fear that we have towards the financial modeling technique. So we need to be a bit more, uh, we must have a, just like we say, ease of doing business. We must have ease of doing research in finance because the tools must be something uh, which we use with confidence, with conviction, with courage, with a deeper understanding. And I think that is going to be made possible uh, through this uh, workshop. You are going to take advantage of that. And once you are, you have with you the right tools, you have with you the right data, you have with you the right processing technique then obviously the ball is set rolling and you it will lead to publications it will lead to policy flow it will lead to action so i wish all of you apply your brains and minds on the inputs which are given here you will see that this is not just something which you can hear and uh, uh, hear and then say okay fine but i will go as i am it is something which you are going to not just hear you are going to listen not just see, you're going to observe things which you will do. And if you do it in that sense, uh, you will have uh, uh, lots to gain from this. So I take this opportunity to thank Professor Vikas. I also take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Biju for taking initiative uh, to organize this. I again, well, once again, uh, give a very warm welcome to Professor Vikas and hope and uh, wish that uh, uh, lots of fruitful uh, academic in, uh, interface will take place between these institutions in future. 
I wish all the delegates the very best for the coming 10 days, and we hope to see some fruitful outcome from this workshop. Thank you so much and wish you all the very best. Yeah, Ambali. Yes. yes. Yeah, th thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Your wisdom and knowledge has yet again. Is it next or is it me who goes so next? Much. I think it's mine. I didn't quite hear it. Okay, so. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the University of Caroline to invite us. Uh, sir, just a second. I think we are having some interference. We've um, telling you how um, academics live their life, and our our role in this uh, in the community where we live, whether it is in Australia, Dubai, uh, India, anywhere. We all share one thing in common, which is we contribute to solving problems in our community. So research is one component. At the end of the day, we are teachers. And because, sir, your and voice is we, we are people that the community trusts. We want to um, educate them, have them solutions. And Dr. Vikas, sir, can you hear me? Doctor Doctor Vikas, sir. Is it better now? Yeah, this is it's much better now. Okay, okay, all right. So yeah, I, I was saying um, um, our, our role uh, is not just to um, to do research. If one understand all the things that even Raju mentioned earlier. A university does consultancy, it engages with the community, etc., etc. And as we embrace our profession, um, we document the problems that our society is going through, and then we write about it. And when we write about something that other people or other civilization hasn't heard about, they find this quite interesting. And when we find it interesting, as long as we can prove our work is uh, it's not flimsy, it's robust, they will publish it. It's as simple as this when it comes down to, uh, to doing research. In doing so, what we're doing is we are putting our society uh, to the next level in terms of developing knowledge, knowledge production, so we can teach uh, the next generation coming how we struggle in our life and how they don't have to struggle anymore because if you follow our steps, you will do better than us. And in doing so, as long as we don't um, do the wrong thing, which is breaching academic integrity, I think uh, uh, we will do well. In our work, and in my experience, it's important to, to do outstanding performance, whether it's teaching, research, or engagement. And if you do an outstanding performance in your research, it is very likely that it will get published in a good journal. Sometimes you may think that you do not have the skills, the power, uh, and the knowledge to do it. It happens every day because we are not born with all, um, all different um, um, capabilities. This is where you need to start thinking about teamwork. If you're in your PhD pro uh, program, you've got your supervisors, and if you're a supervisor, you probably have other team members like collaboration internationally, etc. But we work together so that we get the job across the line and so on. Uh, one thing that you need to remember, um, academics are not the normal kind of people in day-to-day -day life. So we, we do well in, in exams, getting high distinctions. We do well in publishing papers. But then when it comes down to talking to normal people on the street, including 
our own family members, we may not be the brightest down there. So my word of caution would be, as you engage in your research, make sure, because you are the next generation, make sure that you are always working uh, with your family members and try to get the work-life balance. Older generation taught me that um, if you sit down and you do your research and you write your papers, etc., uh, you probably have other health issues. And for that matter, you need to uh, find a sports, walking, jogging, etc. So um, this, this is um, uh, some key important point that I would like to mention. And I've got a series of other things that I think us, we should take into consideration when, while doing um, um, uh, our job. Now, the reality, though, is as a, as, a, um, as a head of a family or as an income earner in your family, uh, you would all agree with me that um, being in academia, it's a nice lifestyle, but there is a current threat at the moment. And it's not just at the moment, it has always been like this, and that is publish or perish. So um, why is it that now we have a ranking system? That's because um, we want to make sure that whatever you say is strong and is supported by the data, etc. So that's why we're bringing um, high quality journal impact factor, etc. in the equation. And that is making our life uh, a bit more um, competitive, a bit more difficult to publish. Okay. So living that sort of lifestyle, uh, why do we publish to start with? It's to secure our employment, making sure we bring uh, uh, food on the table after a hard week of work or any time that we finish working. Now, um, if I go back to uh, if I go back to to a long time ago when I started, like 21 years ago in academia, um, people were just focusing on, on on teaching, and teaching brings a lot of money, and as uh, you teach and you become uh, more experienced in teaching, well, you become very expensive for the organization. So they need to find a way of how to uh, make sure that your income doesn't increase as much. So that's when we started introducing, well, you need to be teaching and research. And now that you're still doing it, the organization is coming up with other dimensions. So you need to bring, um, say, a research income, or you can't have research income now, PhD completion. So our, our workload uh, is evolving as time passes, and I don't think the universities are to be blamed, and that's because uh, funding is not available. So as government take on other challenges, they try to keep uh, cut the budget on, on universities, and universities have to thrive, and we're seeking ways on, on, on how to build it on. And that is our reality, and when you're thinking about publishing and getting your PhD completion, and getting your research income, and you think that is it, you're safe. You're not, because when you go for promotion, they will say, what is your global impact factor? So who are the people that read your work? Uh, how did you do it? Et cetera, et cetera. The challenges never stops, uh, and it will keep changing. I think um, by the time I retire, I think uh, it would be a totally different environment. And all this workshop is doing is taking one component and in that one component, um, we're going to take the, uh, uh, we're going to give you some um, background and some tools that you can use to at least address the one issue of um, publication. And if you work smart, uh, working smart in this case is to combine uh, for three or four elements together. What do I mean by this? Uh, if you have to uh, prepare your lecture and you write about your paper that you've published, well, you are killing two birds with one stone. If you then give an assignment to your students to do the literature review on something that you want to look into, well, you're doing your research at the same time you, you, you are uh, doing your teaching. Now, if you get your PhD student to work in the same area, well, you are doing your research publication. So there is a way where you can build momentum in our field and um, if you use uh, what we call the teaching research nexus, I think it's, uh, it's a, a solution that will propel you to uh, make sure that uh, you achieve your goals when it comes down to, um, to work. Having said that, uh, there's no such thing like uh, an easy run in academia. It is still hard work. Uh, don't get um, 
uh, don't think for one minute that it is just a six hour job where you have to teach. I find it is a 40 hour work uh, that is just to start with and you start there's no ending it's only when you're tired that you end and one key piece, uh, piece of advice is um, make sure that you're having fun while you're doing it select a topic that you love and then when you are spending time you, you would think I can't believe they're paying me to do this because I'm having so much fun I can't get out more and these guys are paying for it if, if you adopt this sort of attitude, as opposed to, oh, my boss says I have to have two publications. Uh, if you adopt the, the first uh, approach that I told you, you will see that academia is a beautiful thing. Now, um, wherever I, I lead a bunch of academics around the world, and my network consists of about 47 um, finance academics who are posted in different parts of the world, and it comprises of 21 universities around everywhere. And we've come up with... Um, uh, agenda as to what we would like to do and again uh, um, the professor just mentioned these days it's a lot of multidisciplinary approach and it is true we for us to move across we need to find something new and our research from 21 onwards will cover economics finance accounting management and marketing and we've um, we've uh, stumbled across a gold mine which is environmental finance now we're building it into sustainable finance. So you will see today's session, later on session, would be around here. And I'll share with you my gold mine. Please go ahead. There's a lot more to publish there. There are new areas in terms of health finance, which is coming forward. And with COVID-19, it's becoming more and more important. Um, and it is an unexplored territory in finance. And if you want to have a unique sort of uh, uh, contribution to finance, this is another area. Uh, fintech uh, is another one. But also, um, I, I'm, I'm getting a bit tired of how, what uh, the universities is telling us to do, what not to do. And sometimes you feel they don't know what they want us to do. So I, I started doing some research on governance of universities and its management just to make sure that we, we are all on the same page and uh, um, things are not going outside. So... Um, Having said that, uh, this is my uh, advice uh, to any one of you joining uh, this workshop. Uh, the advice is, remember, uh, we are academics, we have a role to play in our community, and research is just one part. And if you combine your research with the others, you will do extremely well. So research, and today, in the next 10 days, it's a very good starting point. It's a very good way of us spending the time together. And that is it uh, for me for my speech. Hello? Uh, yeah, thank Emily? You, thank yeah. you, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, I think all of us were able to relate to the publish or perish threat. Uh, thank you, sir, for motivating us to never give up. Thank you. Thanks again. Uh, let's move on with the uh, session. Okay. Uh, would you would, would you give me the uh, the, uh, uh, the access to, um, to 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 share my screen? Uh, sir, we yeah. have a few yes. more. Uh, uh, I can't share anymore. It's saying I can't share. I'm not sure why. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, sir, we we will have some uh, our faculty's felicitation. So we will be uh, finished within within ten minutes, and after that, uh, the technical session oh. will be continued. Okay. 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 No. Okay. okay um, let, let's let's move on to the fence. We, we are glad to invite Dr. Resia Begum, yes, Professor of Department of Commerce and the Dean Faculty of Commerce for both Kerala and MG University, to address the gathering. Vikash uh, Ramaya, sir, we will resume the session after a few minutes of uh, felicitations. Most respected, Professor and Head, am I audible? Yes, yes, yes ma'am. Ma yes, yes ma'am. Yes, ma Most respected, Professor and Head, uh, Dr. G. Raju, uh, respected Director IQC, Professor Simon Tuttle, who is the Director of School of Business Management and Legal Studies. There is my distinguished resource person for today, 
ഡോക്ടർ വികാസ് രാമയ്യ ദ ഓർഗനൈസിംഗ് സെക്രട്ടറി ഡോക്ടർ ബിജു എ വി ദ ബ്രെയിൻ ആൻഡ് സോൾ ആസ് ഡിസ്ക്രൈബ് ബൈ ദ എച്ച് ഒ ഡി രാജു സർ മൈ അതർ കൊളീഗ്സ് അറ്റ് ദ ഡിപ്പാർട്ട്മെന്റ് പ്രൊഫസർ പി എൻ ഹരികുമാർ ഡോക്ടർ ബിജു ടി മിസ് ലക്ഷ്മി മിസ്റ്റർ വിനു അശോക് ദ റിസോഴ്സ് പേഴ്സൺസ് ഫോർ അതർ ഡേയ്സ് for press a few of them are present online i think all the teachers scholars and delegates attending this inaugural function the support team of this program aparna snehit akhil nithi all of you bhagavadi all of you they are rendering uh, support for the smooth conduct of this program good evening all of you Uh, i think the resource person wants to continue with the session after the uh, i mean felicitations we will uh, go back to his uh, presentation at the very outset uh, let me join in congratulating the in congratulating conference secretary professor g raju sir who is the hod and the organizing secretary dr bichu ab and the team behind this for all the efforts taken for organizing this 10 day program international workshop and conference on contemporary finance research tools and publications organizing a 10 day program of this scale is not an easy task that everyone know uh, dr simon tatil has given an excellent presidential address uh, vikash ramaya has started with his uh, presentation presidential address was in fact very Uh, excellent which has given the required prelude for this uh, program uh, i understand that uh, this finance research team has divided into nine sub teams each day will be handled by each team sub team will be handled by different resource persons one day is as in six ten day program nine days for workshop and one day is set apart for the conference which will give an opportunity for the participants for making their paper presentations eminent resource persons in the field are identified uh, we have just tasted the proficiency of two speakers professor simon and uh, dr vikash ramayya the takeaways of a program or a workshop or seminar or conference any academic program for that matter uh, depends on the resource person and the delegates resource persons uh, in the eminent resource persons in the uh, field are uh, selected then it depends on the effort taken by the organizing team during the pre conference phase in communicating and reaching out to the prospective uh, delegates who are the intended beneficiaries of this program i feel both ways the this 10 day program would be a grand success eminent resource persons are there the true intended beneficiaries are identified and more than on 60 participants are participating online along i am told i am i understand that along with today's uh, excellent resource person professor ramayya vikas ramayya we will be having uh, scholars academicians from a uh, university of mumbai gujarat university kochi uh, university of science and technology iit mumbai isid new delhi iscc bangalore and of course scholar i mean academicians from university of kerala regarding the delegates we are most happy that a large number of delegates have shown interest for registering for this program and for, and i hope you will be taking advantage of the fruitful uh, sessions which will be handled by the most appropriate resource persons selected for handling different teams i with these words i wish all the delegates a very fruitful learning and i wish all the very such a very good success for the program i hope all the 10 days would be very fruitful very effective in terms of achieving its uh, desired objectives wishing you all the very best thank you Thank you ma'am for your kind words. We now invite Dr. P. N. Harikumar, Professor, 
department of commerce to felicity the gathering most respected head of the department judge sir dean faculty rasia ma'am and the senior professor and uh, director of our school dr simon sir my colleagues bijuti bichu av the conference secretary vinu and lakshmi Mr. Scholars and the other participants. At the outset, I welcome the great personality, the great professor, Dr. Vikas Ramaya, to our department for this particular program. I am very proud of being a member of this organizing committee because the topic selected for the finance research, the topic for the conference and workshop is very, very vital. It is very difficult to organize a conference in the area of financial research because that methods and application in financial research is entirely different from the application of the methods and techniques in HR and marketing. We can rarely see in this type of conference and workshop organized by some of the universities in Kerala and also outside Kerala. That is why in this occasion, I congratulate Dr. Biju and uh, the head of the department, Jajusar, for the selection of this wonderful topic for their seminar, conference and workshop. So I hope that this program will be a great proof for the research scholars especially in the area of finance research. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your most enlightening words. To felicitate, felicitate the gathering, we invite Dr. Biju T, Associate Professor, Department of Commerce. Respected Chair of this inaugural session, Professor Dr. Gabriel, Gabriel Simon Tuttle. Respected uh, Professor and Head of the Department, uh, Professor Dr. G. Raju, sir. Honorable Guest of Honor, Dr. Vigas Ramaya, sir. Respected Dean of Faculty of Commerce of the University, Professor Dr. Asya Bigamma. Dear Professor Dr. P. N. Harikumar, sir. Dear friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Biju Avi and other colleagues, delegates and uh, RSS scholars, a, a very good afternoon to all of you. We are now witnessing the inaugural session of the much awaited international workshop and conference on the topic contemporary finance research tools and publication. Actually, the event has been selected under the leadership of uh, our dear Dr. Biju Avi, the organizing secretary as well as uh, our professor and head, uh, Dr. G. Raju, sir. They have selected it very carefully and meticulously, shelved with deliberations by experts showing committed exposure towards quality of research in finance. There are all reason to believe that the even the position towards a most vibrant academia who is very eager to get sensitized or to fine-tune the research kit on finance of present. For me, actually a research tool is a fine device to capture even the minute details in financial patterns. A good tool is like a fine surgical apparatus which causes minimum blood loss and collateral damage. We are actually very positive and certain on the outcome as the air is full of enthusiasm. Wishing you all very productive sessions. Let me sign out by congratulating the organizing secretary and the team and congratulations to all the participants too. Once again, welcome uh, Dr. Vikas Ramaya to our department. Thank you all, thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your kind words. We RDRS Dr. Biju A.V., the Organizing Secretary, Assistant Professor, Department of Commerce, University of Kerala, 
who has put his sweat and blood into coordinating this event to propose the vote of thanks. Most respected head of the department, uh, Dean Professor uh, of uh, Department of Commerce uh, and the Director of IPAC University of Kerala, Professor Debray Simon Sajjav sir, and our chief uh, guest and uh, inaugural address, the person who uh, gave the inaugural address, Vikash Ramaya, and Professor of the Department Harikumar sir and uh, Bijuti sir and other uh, respected dignitaries and the participants and scholars. So I would like to mention a few words or sentence. Please excuse me because, uh, sir, I will be uh, finished uh, within, within three minutes. The international workshop and conference is truly uh, special to us because of our present head of the department, Professor Raju Sar's headship tenure is going to end in the month of June. This is going to be the last international program organized by the department under his headship tenure. So this uh, speciality is made it uh, through this program. During the planning phase of the program, I have gone through the profile of many eminent people, which includes uh, Professor Vikas Ramaya, Vishal Gupta of Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad. And I have dropped mail to these persons, and I have got an immediate reply from Professor Vikas, and replied that go forward with the program, also given me some ideas and themes to do the program. The themes and ideas of Vikas were acted as the foundations of this workshop. So I should give the full credit to the Vikas sir for the uh, generation of themes of the workshop. And I was surprised that a high-end academician has high portfolio responded so down to earth manner, shows his true spirit and sincere approach towards learning. The, then we have uh, dozens of email conversations every day. Finally, we reached the present stage. I would say we can hope a growth in academics through the future collaborations with Professor Vikas. So uh, here the participants can hear the efficiency of the stock market from the real person who have papers in the A-star journals, such as Journal of Behavioral Finance, Journal of Applied Economics, and Journal of Banking and Finance. At the outset, I extend my sincere gratitude to Professor Vikas Ramia for this, uh, for this session. Uh, today and tomorrow gonna happen. Similarly, we have taken so many efforts for the setup of other resource persons uh, or content providers. Uh, they are being freely, uh, I mean, I believe we have caught up strong quality content providers in India uh, and outside country who are going to deliver lectures here. So already mentioned the, uh, mentioned about the resource person who are going to deliver lectures in this workshop. So hope the participants will get motivation and direction from because in terms of the ideas and strategies for publications. In fact, best publications are lacking here in the Indian continent. So we can hear the problems or issues of us for that uh, from the real person, uh, from that real person through interaction. So at the outset, I sincerely thank uh, my boss, head of the department, for the wholehearted support for the organization of this program. He was very supportive during his busy, busy business of academics. I would like to thank our dean professor, Professor Rasia Begum, madam. She is always motivated like an inspiration to us for doing this kind of programs. Even though the Dean is busy with so many matters, but very positively responded and joined our program. Thanks a lot, madam. And I would like to thank Professor Simon Patil, IQC Director of University of Kerala. I would say his ideas and skills are great and he is a real guiding force as well as role model for us. The path given by him are strongest path to reach this level. We always admire him. Thank you, sir. So I would like to thank Professor Hadi Kumar sir, a person with strong ideas of research who has enriched us always. Thanks a lot for his presence. I thank Dr. Bijuti, uh, the guiding force, for his valuable support and comments from the beginning. And I thank Lakshmi, uh, our strong technical supporter to this program, and Vinu Ashok, the man who is catching up errors uh, very fastly. And I should thank the scholars and students who are working very hard for the last one and a half month with this. I hope they are the backbone of the conduction of the program. I thank the department office, program office. Uh, I, I should thank uh, Aparna, Akil, Nidhi Krishna, Arun, Snehit, Kartiga, Anne Mary, 
I should mention these names for the for my satisfaction. Their efforts are efforts of these people are countless. Thanks to the participants who joined across the country and outside. I hope this will be a definitely a worthy business for you. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Uh, um, with this, we have uh, successfully inaugurated the conference, and I know that all of us are eager to listen to this much-awaited talk. So, without any further ado, let's start the technical session one. Uh, Dr. Vikas, sir, sir, are you there? Yep, yep, I can. Yeah, I'm there. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we hand over the session to you, sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So it was good to hear uh, all the hard work and well done everybody for a, a wonderful start of, of, of this workshop and session. So this first session will be about emerging research in equity, derivatives market, uh, trading strategy and extreme portfolio selection. So um, let me let me start by explaining to you how I got involved in uh, in, in in this uh, in, in in this sort of uh, research. If you remember when I was talking earlier, I said, "Well, um, the way you do research is not about um, going through the literature review and find a gap. That's one way, of course. But then there's the other one, which is you live your life and then you come." or stumble across a particular problem, and then you try to solve it. And that's how I stumble uh, in, in this field. I was teaching at the time at the university at RMIT, uh, and, and I went home, and, um, and somebody knocked on my door and said, um, we would like to change all your light bulb to energy saving bulbs. And I said to him, look, I don't have any money. I just bought the house. I seriously don't have any cash flow. It costs too much. I can't do it. They go, no, you don't understand. We'll do it for free. Seriously? Are you a thief or why would you come to my house? Um, he says, no, no, look at us. We're all government um, um, workers and we're just changing. It's part of our, our sustainability program in, in, in Australia. I go, oh, by all means, just change. A week later, they came back and they changed other aspects of the house. Uh, your shower head, you name it. And then the third week, I went to teach and I said to my students, can you tell me who's making money out of this? So whoever is getting contracts from the government, whichever company that is, I want to invest in them right now because it's going to be a growth uh, place. And let's find out. So we did our first uh, sort of research and, um, and we got an A-star publication for it. And after that, we never stopped. If you look at my Google Scholar website, you will see environmental environment and this happened a long time ago this was at the start when nobody was talking about environmental finance yes there were uh, scholars in other disciplines talking about environmental economics uh, environmental accounting but it was not quite there in the finance and that's when i started uh, working on this so the way i've structured today's presentation is i'll give you a bit of an introduction literary review and where you want to focus is the methodology. And that's a tool that I would give it to you as a uh, breadwinner tool. And I, I did a similar, I did a Gyan program about a year and a half ago in, um, in, in India. And two years later, I am seeing a lot of people who attended that workshop publishing in A journals using uh, Indian data set. And to me and my, 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 uh, my group of network, when they see these papers coming, they say, Vic, we've got competition from India. And I said, let me have a look at these names. And I, oh, these are the people that are trained. Good on them. They are, they are making a killing. It's lovely. So I, I, two years later, I'm seeing papers coming from this methodology. Now, it is not a secret. Uh, this methodology is just a simple event study methodology. And it addresses a number of issues, and people are reading them. It's a methodology that is very well um, accepted in the finance uh, literature. And it's, uh, it's not like you're building something new. We don't know what you're, you're testing at the end of the day. It's a very well-established tool, and people are testing for it. 
Now, you may think that I'm giving you uh, away this tool for, for no reason, or it's, uh, I'm going to be... Uh, I'm going to be facing uh, really tough competition from people that I'm training. No, that's because we have so many places that it can be applied. And I'll show you personally where I have applied them in the equity markets and how many A and A stars publication I've got from them. It's a simple tool. And if you master it and if you do it well, you execute it well, I don't see any reason why people would not publish your work. And in this presentation, I'm going to show you how, how I've applied it in Australia, China, US, France, UK, you name it. It's the same technique that we can apply and replicate somewhere else. We all know that um, replication is not what will get you in an A star. It can get you in an A, but not necessarily an A star. Having said that, what you will see is people are interested to know what is it that you're doing in your life that we are not doing. And that's why I keep saying, if you focus your research on how we live our life and you get a story and you can tell the rest of the world what it is about, it is very likely that they will publish your work in an A journal, even if it is a replication. So when we started researching this, um, um, we, we stumbled across what the, the, the Austrian government has signed up. Well, in 2005, there was a Kyoto Protocol on climate change. And what it, what it did was it, uh, it brought in a, a number of countries around the world. They sat down and they said, okay, we have to do something about this environment. We have to reduce CO2 emissions. We've got to protect our environment. Now, one of the countries that signed up for it was the Australian government. And to do so, they've pledged that they will reduce their CO2 emissions to a certain level by 2020. So that's when they started putting all these environmental regulations, putting it in the parliament, and then the market starts to react. And this is, uh, these are the people, the product that you saw, the people coming to my house, were products of what the regulations brought into. So then we change our thing, our, 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 our paper to say, how does the equity market react to these policies? A simple question, but also a very good question for not just academics, but also for practitioners. Why? Practitioners are always looking for a way to make money. If we see that you can make money and there's a trend in, say, environmental regulations, and now it's been on sustainable investment strategies, so if we can make money way before anybody else, it makes sense for them to read our papers. So that's how we started. So the question then is, where do we invest? Who do we invest with? And the answer was a simple, we don't know. And that to me was great because how do we know that we don't know? I've asked my students to dig into the literature, find out where to invest when we have environmental regulations. They said, Professor, we can't find anything. And I said, seriously, you don't find anything? Oh, great. That means I'm now going to spend my time and, and, and work on this project. So that's how I started in this field. And, and when you go into environmental regulations, very quickly, um, you, will, you will come across uh, a number of problems. And these problems would be in terms of, we live into a finance world. We don't like regulations. We want free market, okay? So then the question is, can we live our life without regulation? And this was a debate that uh, a professor called Imad Musa and I had while flying to a conference, uh, we end up writing this now book. How do you feel about life without regulation? So what we came back with was, well, when you have no regulation, uh, people uh, in a world where we live now, where we have regulation, people are selling beef as with mud cow disease in, in Europe. People are selling horse meat, labeling it as, as, as beef. Uh, Aircrafts are using bogus parts and they're falling off uh, uh, the sky. In Bangladesh, media construction standards are not being met. Uh, Bernie Madoff running Ponzi scheme. And in India, you know very well about Bhopal Express. In America, we keep hearing more and more stories about Enron and falsifying uh, financial statements. So in a world where we have really decent regulations to protect us from doing uh, scandalous matters like this, um, we believe if you have no regulation, these things would be 
everyday news to a point where we would not find it uh, atrocious anymore. We'll say, ah, oh, this is business as usual. Now, throughout uh, time, uh, any piece of regulation that comes in, it will be debated in, in the parliament. And if you look at, if, if you take environmental regulation and you put fintech regulation, or you put any kind of regulation in it, you will see the same argument would be discussed in the parliament. People will talk about it's going to be a red tape. Uh, I don't think you've heard because capture theory is not something that uh, people talk a lot, and I'm, I'll probably have to explain the capture theory. The capture theory is, you know, uh, if you have bankers and they're doing all sorts of things, making money, they don't uh, respect the regulation because of GFC crisis, etc. So what the government will do is they will, if people are acting like cowboys, the government will bring in a sheriff. A sheriff will be the regulator. So the regulator will come in, put in all these regulations, right, and to slow down the market. But then as they talk to the bankers and they get to know, okay, the bankers are not making money, people lose their jobs, etc., they try to relax uh, the regulation again. So this is when the sheriff is being captured by the same group of people that he came down to sort of uh, uh, to, to, to whip. So that's the capture theory. But the whole point of this, of me telling you this, is regulations, deregulations, it create opportunities for us to do research. And because they are new things that it has been implemented, it creates an amazing opportunity for all of us finance researchers to look into. Unfortunately, in my experience, what I find is if um, followers like other finance uh, researchers, they look at general finance and they find out, okay, these guys done this, we're gonna go and replicate that. And yeah, you sometimes get into A star just by replicating it and telling others their works are good. But we already know about these aspects of our life. There's not much value added, but then when you find new events coming in, for me at least, I find it very fascinating. And I just go, okay, I'll pick this. I'm going to find something and tell you what you don't know about this. And that's how I build my research, uh, sort of uh, equity research uh, uh, papers. So again, there's economic argument that will come in terms of um, regulations will create unemployment, will, uh, will do uh, uh, impedes competitiveness, will increase prices, uh, will reduce productivity. Now, I, I wrote a book where I, I proved but none of this happened in the case of environmental regulation. So again, these new things that are happening gives you ideas of how to prove or disprove certain aspects of what is happening. Now, when you get into the area of environmental, environmental regulations, you can't just go and run your modeling, which is run your, your tools to find out if uh, you get some results. It doesn't work this way. You have to first go into the literature and see if somebody has looked into it. And if they have looked into it and they've told you what the solution is, there's no point in you wasting three years of your life doing a research that has already been published about. So you might as well just go and look for something else. So that's why the starting block of anything is the literature review. And when I digged in into the literature review, I told you there was nothing on environmental regulations and where to invest. but I have to give credit to the economic society who's got uh, economics um, uh, and environmental economics. But as I, I dig deeper in regulation, I come across a massive amount of literature. And this literature is about economic regulations. So here we're talking about a debate that happened and that even caused a war between, say, US and other countries that follows uh, communism. So we've seen the Cold War uh, emerging because people have a difference in opinion as to how we should live our, our life in an economic environment. So if I move this on the side, because I really don't want to uh, get involved with the Russians and Americans and get caught up in, in the crossfire, I decided to move into financial uh, regulation. Financial regulation, again, there is a hot debate always with uh, people who want to make money. We call them the free marketeers. And they can be very, very uh, difficult on you if you write that you need to regulate the market. Again, me being a safe one, I didn't want to venture, but I, do I know about what they've written? Of course I do. And thanks to uh, my literature review. Then I move into the environmental regulation. So there I had to go a bit technical, and that's where uh, the multidisciplinary comes in. 
So I needed to read about CO2 emissions and the causes and the effects, etc. And over there, in that literature, they, they talk about the environment cannot take care of itself. And when do we need regulation? We need regulation when you have a weak party and that party requires a bit of protection. So that's when I thought, OK, I think I can live with this. And that is me uh, just being comfortable with saying I am not going to um, fight with anyone. In fact, I'm going to contribute to a, a, a to our society in a way that it needs to be protected. So I picked up a number of my PhD students. I've got a lot of followers. And all we do, we did at the time, was to work on uh, environmental issues. Today, people are calling it in uh, Australia, we use the term environmental finance. Uh, in um, Europe, they call it sustainable finance. In America, who recently joined uh, the queue in terms of working in this space, they're calling it uh, uh, climate change finance. Um, in China, they call it green finance. So different people are calling it different way. But at the same time, it is gathering momentum. And if you were to do some work in this field, I would say the chances of publication right now is massive. If you look at the core of papers from sustainable finance, it's increasing. And it got to a point where me, I am about to leave this because I can see there's momentum, people are coming, and my contribution will be very minimal from here, and I will start hitting the C's and the B's. So I am moving out uh, of this space, and I'm moving, of course, I'll show you where I'm moving. Uh, at the end, I'll show you where I'm moving because there's not much I can contribute based on the society where I've lived so far. So one thing that you'll see in the literature that is very well documented is the pollution heaven hypothesis. So in Australia, what we saw when the regulations came in, it was very, very costly for uh, organizations to do business, especially manufacturing industries, to country, continue to pollute in Australia. What they did was they moved to China. So then China, Chinese regulations uh, were a bit lower in terms of standards compared to uh, compared to um, Australia. And for that matter, you've seen almost everybody in the world goes there in China and pollute. It's an indirect pollution because you ship all your production line in China and then you say, China, you are polluting. We are not. It's not true because we contribute to this pollution. So now that China has reached its, uh, its level where the, the people there are having a decent income, and they've reached a growth level where they, they think their society is OK, they are trying now to reduce CO2 emissions in China. So they are increasing their environmental regulations. And we are seeing a lot of Chinese scholars uh, taking into account what their government is doing, writing about them now, and you're seeing a new wave of regulations, environmental things coming out in China. At the same time that they are putting um, uh, regulations in China, Vietnam comes into place. And you heard before that I am um, a, a scholar, a, a professor in, uh, in a university, which, which is the second best university in Vietnam called Tom Duc Tam. And the reason why they brought me down there is because Vietnam is now the pollution heaven. So they've opened up for people to come and do production on their land. So they want to do something very different, which is we grow now, we clean now approach, which is um, as we are getting pollution, we need to use stuff that will reduce CO2 emissions at the same time. So, and if you heard about my appointment as uh, in, in Changing Academy of Environmental Sciences, this is actually an environmental protection agency. And they do research, and I do the research for them in the area of business. Okay. Now, these matters, uh, they, they don't just uh, stay in, uh, uh, in, 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 say, China. They also happen to be big debates in Europe and in, uh, in the United States. And if you look at, say, before uh, Barack Obama, we had George Bush. And George Bush was asked to tackle issues on climate change. And he refused on the basis of financing. And what he used as an argument was cost and benefit analysis. His argument was very simple. You're telling me to put up all these windmills. I can see the costs involved, and you can do it. And you want me now to go and put windmills and all these energy saving uh, uh, equipment throughout the country. That is a cost. But what are the benefits of it? 
I don't know. So perhaps if you put a windmill in a place, you are expecting wind to happen uh, 24 hours a day, but maybe it's seasonal. Maybe there will be hours where there won't be any wind. We won't be able to produce electricity, etc. You don't know about these things. So I need you to go and do a study, a pilot study, and then come back. Now, these studies car, uh, will, will take two to three years. Two to two, three years later, he was no longer the president. It was somebody else's problem to deal with the environment. So we're seeing people using financial arguments um, to, to, to differ certain things that they don't want, and, and politicians are using it. And Barack Obama, at the same time, uh, to gain the, uh, the support of uh, Europeans, he has had to uh, tackle uh, environmental uh, regulations. Now, environmental regulations, for many people, it means different things. So, for instance, in Australia, when all these policies were coming in, and I saw, okay, now I have all these light bulbs, and I am buying, say, uh, energy-saving bulbs, and everything is energy-saving in my house. I've got solar panel systems, but then there's no pollution. I go for my jog, and I can breathe. It's a beautiful place to live and uh, jog and run, family outings, you name it. Do I actually need environmental regulations? That was a question that was popping up in my head around the time. And then I asked the same question on China. So I read a, a literature review in China that talks about there's about 400 and 452 or 56,000 uh, kids, babies, dying prematurely because of pollution. This equates to every five minutes, there's four premature deaths because of pollution in China. So it makes sense for me to then go there and look at what's going on. And that's what I did. I, I went and did a study in China, which I will show you the results later on. And China has got cancer villages where people work with mercury and they die at the age of 30. So we have all sorts of things. And what it means in China is different from what it means in Australia, in a sense that environmental regulations in China saves lives. So it's not just an empirical analysis that we're doing, but also something that uh, the ministry knows. So when we started um, um, uh, our, our study in the area, of course, we had to come up with some hypotheses. So in terms of um, you have a regulation, how do you think um, the market will behave? So we are thinking, well, it could be positive, it could be negative, it could also be no reaction. There's three possible outcomes. So at first, when these regulations were hitting the market, people thought this is the end of the world. It has to be bad. Business will be bad. So what we said was not necessarily. Why? Because for polluters, it's bad news. But for environmentally friendly, it's good news. So if you put a stringent policy, it would be bad news for polluters, but good news for environmentally friendly ones. So we need to look at it from a different angle. Now, then I have to explain, why is it that it will be negative? Well, the, um, the environmental regulation will increase the cost of production for polluters, decrease the cost of production for environmentally friendly uh, businesses through subsidies, etc. And in, in the case of, uh, of, uh, of polluters, it will occur in, in terms of a tax. So that would be the effect. And also, you should also not forget that the cost and revenue function of certain industry will not even be affected. And I'll explain that later on uh, as I follow. And of course, not every sector would be affected in a similar manner. So remember, uh, you need to also focus on the, um, the efficient market hypothesis in finance that says, OK, if Regulation is coming. For the first time we hear, hear about it, the stock market will react. But then the same regulation is taken to different states, like uh, Victoria, New South Wales, and then they say, okay, we're going to implement it. Now, when they implement it on a second level, on a second layer, would that affect the stock market? Then, when the state, say, uh, Victoria decides to do it, and then now the city of Melbourne, would the city of Melbourne adopt these policies? They have to. Now, when they adopt this, would this affect the stock market? So we have three layers. So you need to then rely on your efficient market hypothesis to tell you whether you should go ahead and look at multi-layered section or stick on the top one. 
And if you look at your efficient market hypothesis, it will tell you stick to the first one because as the same news occurs again and again, the market will not react because it's no longer coming as a surprise. So we need to think about all this when we get into, um, um, into areas like this. What I find is a number of people, they don't really think about this and they, write, they say, okay, Vic, you've done it at a, at a national level. I'm going to do it at a state level. Uh, and they send me the papers to review as a reviewer. And I go, I don't have to read this paper. You have no results. I'm not expecting any results. I flip up at the back, look at it, no results. I don't waste my time. I just got rejection. Because again, what you're violating is you don't know your theory. If you don't know your theory, uh, it, it would be very difficult for you to go into. Now I'm going to go into some technicalities about climate change, um, like what sort of um, um, what sort of emissions are things that we are looking into into uh, in finance these days. Uh, uh, climate change. If you look at say Kyoto Protocol, they talk about a number of six different kinds of uh, uh, emissions that we need to control: CO2, methane, nitrous oxide. Etc. Etc. As you can see, I'm not very good with the technical side of uh, these uh, chemicals uh, or their names. And the reason why I point them to you today is because if you look at integrated reporting, which is uh, uh, a um, a framework set by IFRS, whereby it is asking companies to report their quality factors, and one of the quality factors is uh, to report on their environmental um, damages that they're doing, meaning they have to report about so how much CO2 emissions they are, they are doing and how much methane, et cetera, et cetera. So they have to have a full disclosure. It is something that Europe has adopted, and we've seen it coming in 2018, okay? And now companies are showing you for the first time their integrated reporting, so integrated reporting is you've got your financial statements, which goes for maybe 100 pages, and then you have 140 or 150 more pages where you write what you're doing in your corporate governance, in your um, uh, business ideas, et cetera, et cetera. So with that in mind, corporations are reporting on this. So if you get, if you give them a task to build a sustainable portfolio, now when you study financial statements, you have to read these quality factors and you've got to go into uh, how much of, a, of CO2 emissions they're doing. And then very quickly, you'll come across that you've got scope one, scope two, scope three, and all these are new things that are coming up on the market. And again, this is becoming like another gold mine. There's so much development there that anyone can start doing research um, and they will, they will be able to publish some work. Now, I need to explain to you uh, this to be able to, to explain to you later on the, the, the risk that we observe. See, in Australia, it's a very democratic country, and I'm very proud to be Australian. Uh, and over there, everything that you do is a matter of debate. So somebody comes in and says, we want to go and do some uh, green policies. They put a, a paper in, and then somebody else says, no, I don't want it. It gets kicked kick out. Next government comes in. I want green policy. The other one says, no, I don't want it. So you've seen uh, policies when they come in and out of Australia, it goes in, out, in, out. And that changes the risk profile each and every time. And this is what we call the wax and wane policies in Australia. And this wax and wane policy, later on, when I showed it in terms of a risk model and how it changes and the sort of shape that it gives you, now I'm seeing a number of scholars publishing whereby they see announcement coming in in the market, which is yes, and, and subsequently comes back as no, and then goes back yes again, no, yes, no, yes, no. And when this happens, we, we, we expect to see what we, what we call a diamond risk shape, uh, a risk shape uh, sort of a, a phenomenon. Now, the methodology is very simple. Um, we use event study methodology. It is straightforward. Anyone who teaches finance, if you study, you would have come across. What you do is you take the actual return, you minus, say, an expected return, and the expected return is uh, proxied by KPM, and if you want it a bit more fancy, you can do a three-factor, four-factor, five-factor model, 
to show that you know your finance quite well. And any difference between your actual return and uh, uh, your expected return is abnormal returns. You calculate the T-statistics within a window period around which uh, your, uh, your, your event is made. And if you find statistically significant risk, then you've got yourself a paper. So if you find that this environmental regulation is causing positive abnormal return, it means investors will be wealthier. And if you find cumulative abnormal you add, say, three days uh, returns together or five days returns together, that becomes your cumulative abnormal returns. If you find it's positive, it means we make money. So what we're expecting now is um, businesses that are environmentally friendly, they will have positive abnormal returns. Uh, we will find wealth destruction for polluters. Now, in other businesses where they can pass on the cost, well, then um, their businesses are protected. You may not see any abnormal returns. Now, in this space, even study methodology is so simple that people love it. It's very well established. But then at the same time, it's, very criti uh, it's, it's, it's been looked at in a very critical and deep manner as well. Which means that when you do event study methodology, you need to have a batteries of robustness test, as many as you can. This is where a lot of scholars coming from a number of countries don't get it. They produce event study methodology and publish me now. Because I know there are so many problems with it, you haven't addressed each and every one of them. It's hard to get through. I will say to you, the Papers that you see published with event study methodology in A stars and A's, look at their robustness tests, learn about how to do them. Most of them, let's say uh, the Chesney et al. 2011, he published this paper. I replicated that uh, as a robustness test. I found it was to adopt a technique that he's just published about. So I thought, okay, I'll look for uh, how to do it. There's not much written. There's no help at all, except for Chesney himself. And I end up writing to him and say, Professor, you know, I'm working on this and I've got this revision. And I, I want to do well, but I don't know how to do it. Can you help me out? So you see, there are approaches that you take. Uh, that's why I say you, you need to um, uh, seek help. Uh, that's why I say teamwork. You go the extra length to do your robustness test. In here, the standard ones that people tend to do is removal of firm-specific factors, and there's some non-parametric tests like Corrado ranking, uh, uh, control for uh, synchronicity, market integration, spillover effects, all these. These are just the starters. And as you do all of this in an A-star journal, the, the other guys will still have to come up with another test for you to do. And these tests, I can guarantee you, you've never heard about them before. They are the new things that are coming up. They would like you to have like a methodological advance so that they can publish it in a good journal. And please take your time. They give you time to do it. Don't rush. Do exactly what they tell you to do. And if you listen to them, the chances increase, uh, the chances improve significantly. If you don't do the one thing they ask you to do thinking you are smart enough to say, no, it doesn't fit here. It doesn't do this, it doesn't do that then um, it is guaranteed that they will reject you. Now, if you see it not adding value when you do these additional steps, put it in an appendix so that they can see uh, their ego will be satisfied. Oh, they've done it. It doesn't work. Okay, that's still something. And they did what I asked them to do. Clearly, they know now what I'm talking about. We are on the same platform. You have to engage with scholars at a higher level when they demand it. And when you get a revision, it's time for you to, to do that. Okay. Now, what I've also done is to create a risk model. And as you can see, this is a, uh, a KPM, an excess return KPM, but I've fitted with some dummy variables. And I've, do, I've added, say, an additive and a multiplicative dummy variable. And anyone with any sound uh, uh, econometrics background will tell me vague, that would lead to multicollinearity. And of course, I have to drop one. It's like uh, I've written the equation uh, from general, and then of course it becomes specific. Now the problem with the first mo uh, model is it will it would be an ag we call it an aggregate model in the sense that if I have 20 environmental regulations in my series, well I'll have one each time that I have one. 
So what will happen is the negative and the positive would uh, uh, will cancel each other. Why do we have negative and positive? In, enter in terms of environmental regulations, you will have, um, say, stringent policies coming in. And then it's not that the government just kill it completely. The government come back and go, I think we're a bit excessive on this. We'll decrease it a little. We'll turn it down a little. So they do a, uh, a lax policy to refine the original one. So when you have stuff like this happening, your positive tend to cancel each other. So when what we did is we create another model, which is what we call the uh, individual short-term risk model, where we give a value of one for, uh, we, we treat each regulation or each event as one, uh, or we, we treat each event with one dummy variable. So if I have 19, I have 19 dummy variables. And then I track down how beta changes over time. Okay. Data is the last problem that we have in finance. You will have data as much as you need. And if you don't have a database, please collaborate with other, other universities and they will send you the data. And of course, uh, you need to work with them. And data is, is the last problem that we have in finance. I, I hear you are, and we will talk about it tomorrow when we go into quantitative research, which is also another area which is coming, particularly when you can't uh, have access to data. We'll cross that bridge tomorrow, and I'll talk to you more about uh, quantitative research. But for now, let's stick to um, let's stick to uh, uh, the quantitative side of event study methodology. Now, I get my results. Uh, these are all the sectors um, uh, that I found where I have negative reaction. So remember, I was hoping to get uh, polluters. These are the biggest polluters, uh, electricity providers. I was hoping to hit uh, the electricity providers. And when I look here, I find no electricity. So it was a bit of a shock to not find them. But little that I knew at the time, and because it was new, even we did not understand what was happening to us in our community. And we published a paper. And what happened was, um, in Australia, when the policies came in, we experienced an increase in electricity prices. Why? As they put in the taxes on electricity, they were able to pass it on onto consumers. Why? Because when the market deregulated in the 1985, the government had another piece of regulation that guaranteed investors in electricity in utility that they will earn say 10 or 15 percent return any subsequent policies that doesn't allow this well it allows the electricity providers to add on the cost to make sure that their investors are getting their returns so that policy failed miserably what it led to our community was electricity price went up all our goods and uh, all our goods that we produce and our services, the price went up. So if you were an Australian family, your cost of living would have increased by 10%. Because of this, there was a bit of a fight in Canberra and the Prime Minister at the time had to resign. And it is all because of a policy like this. And if you look at the results, you have beverage that were affected. Um, why beverage? That's because beverage is made up of wine producers and wine, Australian wine producers compete heavily in the international market. And the, the wine that we're talking about, they're not expensive wine. They are like your uh, $10 Australian uh, bottle of wine. In Dubai, you get them for maybe uh, 35, 36 dirhams, uh, which probably would be, I don't know, 360 rupees. So these wines are, are very competitive and you compete with Chile. You compete with France, you compete with uh, America. And these guys, these other countries, they haven't adopted environmental regulations. Their costs haven't gone up by 10%. And that led to uh, Australians losing in uh, competitiveness internationally. So, of course, we were not happy about that. And that's what led to a change. When you look at environmentally friendly, you, you don't quite get it there. You see uh, industrial engineering. And industrial engineering, why do they come up uh, positive? That's because of Kyoto Protocol, 
uh, has led to the, en the engineers cannot produce any manufacturer, cannot manufacture or grant uh, the authority to manufacture any product that doesn't re reduce CO2. If you have uh, a, a car coming out, it will not get its license to produce if it doesn't re reduce CO2 to exist from existing levels. So then these guys knew which, uh, which business will flourish and which one will not. So they were the ones that were flourishing. As you can see, I find electricity here on, uh, on where it's not affected. So then we start to think about, okay, is this really working in Australia? Well, I went straight to look at direct measures. And mind you, when I do that, now I'm competing with uh, economics. So now we venture in environmental uh, economics, which I don't want to do, but in a book that I wrote, I showed that despite us doing all these policies and being uh, taking leads in the world, uh, we are not seeing a slowing down in the CO2 emissions or methane or nitrous oxide or anything like that. But lessons that we've learned is every time you change your regulation, remember my uh, individual dummy variable? The, the risk of polluters increases when you put stringent policy, and it decreases for environmentally friendly. And if, you ch if Australia changes its mind, the risk goes back to what it's meant to be previously, and a reversal happens for environmentally friendly. As you can see, every time we have a wax and wane policy, there is a change. And again, this is something new that we did that nobody else showed. And that's why we got an ASTOP uh, uh, publication. And that's what we are referring to diamond restructure. And as we extend this into other fields like banking regulations, uh, um, financial regulations, or any kind of regulations where you tend to have, yes, the government comes in strong, and then they come back, they relax it a little, a, a, you find uh, this sort of diamond structure popped up. I, I, I replicate the study and published it as well in a B journal, not an A, and I don't have a gut to send it to an A because they will say, Vic, come on, don't try to fool us. It's the same thing. You're just replicating. So you sell it to a B easy, and these guys in the B journal would love it because they say, okay, we don't have a piece like this. We see mainstream is publishing this. Give me a piece. Okay, I'll take it. So there, uh, we replicate the paper and we establish something that we say, yes, there is abnormal returns around environmental regulations. And now we start to be a bit cocky where we say, oh, we're going to give it a name. So we call it the green effect. And we even start to write stuff about it to say it's a market anomaly because you can get green effect, even though people know about environmental policies uh, bring, bringing all these effects and we still can make money. And we show now... Um, this is what I call mathematical masturbation. This is where you, every model that you, you possibly can hear about, we just throw it in. And we say, yeah, we can do this. You want hard stuff? We can play. Um, this is how difficult it is to publish in a B journal, uh, even though it's a replication. I have to prove them that, no, we are doing additional work here, and, and it's, it's not a, 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 a walk in the park for us. Now, in terms of, uh, of the results in China, we got some really good results in terms of we find polluters being affected, like coal, uh, energy sector being negatively affected. Environmentally friendly, we get some uh, environmentally friendly business. Now, in China, the risk model gives us something very different. Once the Chinese government decided to adopt environmental regulations, you know, the Chinese says they've got the arm, uh, the iron fist, or something, so it shows up in their policy. Once they decided that this is the case, the risk of polluters continue to increase. The risk of uh, environmentally country continues to decrease. So we saw something very different in China, and, and of course we published it. And like I told you, uh, the uh, policies were more tailored towards uh, health actions. So all the things that they were doing on sustainable developments, chemicals use in, um, in food, etc. Uh, were the policies that the Chinese were doing. Then we, we decided to check what uh, America, you would not believe me, around the time publishing all these papers, when we went to look at what Americans were doing, they were quite behind in, in, these, in, in, in this space. So it's only recently that the Americans are coming uh, on, on this platform to, to talk about environmental issues. So when I got into there, 
there was not many policies coming out before Obama. But around Obama, we saw a number of things emerging. So because it's, uh, it's, uh, Obama came out not just with environmental regulations, he came up with, I think, four different um, uh, agendas, like health, peace, environmental regulations. I can't remember the other one. So as uh, Obama come up with this, um, we see a lot of movement. And I play around, write the next paper, and because it was about the U.S. market, I happened to get a, um, an a publication on it because I showed the world how Obama was liked by the Europeans and they were not liked by the Asians, like Singapore, uh, Hong Kong, etc. So you would not believe me. Um, I don't think uh, it was his paper, but it was, it was validating what um, Americans knew because um, Barack Obama got the feedback, got the poll that he was disliked or not liked in Asia. He ended up taking his uh, Air Force One through to there and said, look, I may be black, I'm a good man though. I can be a brother to you, the Chinese. And that was how he did it to make sure that he was able to uh, keep pace in the world and maintain world order, uh, etc. Now, when you take about, when you take this, uh, when you take, uh, um, when you take this same policy and you go to the UK, the UK has got different problems. Their problems was how to generate uh, electricity for this large amount of population. And at the time of, of us doing um, this paper, uh, they were having debates on nuclear power. So we picked up this nuclear power debate and uh, we ended up publishing in an A journal. Okay. So as we travel the world, looking, sitting in our office in Melbourne, and tracking down, um, we, 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 we were publishing in eyes, and it was easy money. And I don't know how easy it is now, um, but uh, back then, we're talking about 10, 15 years ago, it was a new field, it was a gold mine, and I still publish it on it. But you see, I have Fam, who is my PhD student. He now probably, he, he, he finished uh, his PhD not long ago. He probably have like 15 publications, most of them are A, a journals in the area. And I publish a lot with him. And, uh, and uh, with Hui, though, when he was doing his PhD, I would not let him stop in his methodology on event study methodology. Because when you do a PhD, you have to go and push the boundaries. So he came up with a set of conditions on how to measure whether an environmental policy is excessive or not. And this did not come because we pull it out of a hat as an example. That is because of the Italian uh, uh, prime minister or president, whoever they have as leaders there, he made, uh, he made a call to some professors in, um, in, in, in NYU or Stern and asked them, look, can you advise me on is EU ETS excessive? Because I see a number of business owners coming to me saying their business are failing and it's uh, EU, uh, EU ETS, which is the environmental regulations out there that is killing them. So I said to Hui, let's develop this set of conditions and test it, and we'll see if uh, uh, these people claims are okay or right. And that's when we, we did our study in Italy, and this paper we haven't published yet. Uh, we published the French version in an average A journal, but not this one. This one, uh, we have to rewrite it because there's so much similarity with the other papers that we published in Germany and France. So. Here we find about 5% of people that failed um, uh, was associated, uh, only 5% failed because of, of regulations. And these businesses, they were already at loss. So we dig in a bit more to find out what was the characteristic of these firms. They were firms that were failing regardless. Uh, and, and environmental regulation is, is um, <laughs> so, uh, I'm so, so I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, participants, please make sure that your uh, audio is mute. Okay, thank you. Thank yeah. you, Amber. So um, uh, that was us uh, probably uh, setting some standards for um, for for uh, Italy. 
But then um, I have another PhD student. Her name is Minhua Yang. As you can see, she's the first author of this paper. And her PhD, because again, I had three or four PhDs around the same time doing environmental regulations. So I needed to make sure that their projects over under the same umbrella, which at the time didn't, was not very known to a lot of people. They said, oh, they're all doing the same literature. They're all doing the same thing. So I said, no, it's different projects. Um, and um, her project was we end up developing a, a score, uh, an effectiveness score of the policies. How uh, effective are these policies? And we applied it in China because she comes from China and China was having a lot of problems. And we applied it in the US as well so that we can do a comparative study because these two are, are, are very uh, uh, close to each other. So this one, um, we develop a, a strategy, but we also apply a number of, uh, of uh, regression analysis. And what we wanted to bring into the discussion here was um, behavioral finance. So we know that leaders who are narcissistic get it their way. So if you have a narcissistic leader in terms of a president of the uh, US, and if he wants uh, uh, environmental regulations, he's going to get it through. And then the polluters will suffer big time. And environmentally friendly would be a good business to be in. So we develop models incorporating now, say, uh, uh, political will, um, behavioral characteristics to, to do our study. So you see how we evolve. And this paper, again, was published in an A journal with no trouble. So now when I moved to Dubai not long ago, and you'd be thinking, why do I move to Dubai? Because uh, fintech is the centerpiece, like what uh, uh, Dubai is doing in terms of uh, blockchain technologies is insane. And since I've been here, I've learned so much more that what we're doing in Australia, it's crazy. And not just on this, um, Australia stopped doing a lot of environmental regulations and Dubai and UAE has picked it up. And UAE is going and, and they expanded the whole research area that I do and they put it on a very different scale. So if you go to ADGM, which is Abu Dhabi Global Markets, you will see the products that you have there is insane. They have a lot of stuff on um, green policies, green, um, green sukuk, uh, derivative index, etc. They have a lot of stuff that they're doing out there that is amazing for scholars like me to go and do some studies. And they created, like uh, I think last year, start of last year before COVID-19 in January, even the Sheikh, the Sheikh came and pledged, yes, we're going to go crazy on sustainable finance. And this is the area that um, we would like to specialize. They are throwing so much money at it. And it clearly, uh, clearly now you understand why I, I am in Dubai. And it's fascinating, uh, the, the stuff that is happening in this space, in the area that I work. And I get to advert, uh, advise uh, ADGM and a number of people uh, in this area. Now, what I'm telling you, integrated reporting is coming. Companies are now looking at their SDGs. Okay, So there's 17 different dimensions. How does the stock market re react to them? We don't know. There's not many studies published in there. So in terms of sustainability, there's a lot of work that can be done. And that's what I have two PhD students right now working on it. So we've made a lot of progress. And we will be the one publishing on them soon, hopefully, and be the first one and still getting our stars and then creating a momentum in this space. But this is another area that we're starting at the moment in, in here. Now, the methodology that I showed you, I personally have applied it in terrorism, tsunamis, bushfire, trading systems, banking regulations, financial regulations, political elections, Brexit, US-China trade war, healthcare expenditure. If you look at this, all of them has given me as produce an A or an A star publication. Uh, a recent paper, paper that I published on Brexit is one of the most cited paper. It has just been released. And people come and see me for advice on Brexit, even though I live in Australia and now I am in Dubai. I get a lot of um, people asking me for advice. Even I have recently published a paper on US-China trade war. Again, it's going to have a, a good impact. And guess what? Um, 
the reason why I say contemporary is also the tool. Even study methodology is a tool that we can use to address anything that can come up. If you are thinking, have I done it on COVID-19? Of course I have. Why would I not? I have papers. We've got, remember Minhua Yang? A paper has already been um, uh, replicated using COVID-19. Health policies, health regulations, and it is under review. We've got a revised new summit in an A. As we are speaking, it is under revised new summit. The tool that I've given you is for life. So tomorrow you find a news. Day after tomorrow you find a different news. Next year you find a different news that is unique we haven't heard of. Go, use this technique. It works. You will get an A publication because people are always worried about what's going to happen. So uh, may I ask, it's, it's, uh, it, is it time um, to finish or can I continue? Because I haven't touched on the other parts yet. Uh, did you, sir? Uh, yeah, uh, it is uh, eight o'clock right now, so uh, we can have interactions. If any, uh, I mean, we can be like uh, extend up uh, up to ten minutes. Okay. okay. So, so okay. What we can do is tomorrow I'll be talking, and maybe tomorrow when I finish, I can uh, I can talk about the other ones depending on how much time I have. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are right. Tomorrow yeah. we can have more time to speak. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's let's do the question time for now, and let's take some questions for now. Thank you, sir. So now we are open for questions. Uh, so let's you know build up a system where we can you can post the questions in the chat box, and we'll discuss it one by one. We'll take one topic at a time. So that we, there's no chaos in the discussion. Okay. So there is no question. Everything was clear. Yeah, um, I would like to uh, start start of the discussion, if that's okay. Lovely. That's good. Yes, sir. It was really fascinating to hear your uh, your take on how how you have done research and how you have done papers on different different uh, fields. Like you talked about environmental regulations and how that affects that's I mean how it is uh, dealt with differently in different countries. Like you talked about UK, China, and US and how things are uh, dealt differently in these countries as well as the sustainable finance as well as uh, even study methodology, but I'm more interested in the regulation part because um, uh, I had approached a few uh, economic pro economics professors, and when we had a discussion on international economics, most of the, most of them were like they were very scared about touching international economics because uh, it's a very dynamic subject; it keeps on changing. So most of the time, uh, they would say that. If you if you if you choose a, to a topic for research in international economics or when it comes to international policies, uh, there is this always a danger of you know having the topic go obsolete. So how can we deal with that? Okay, it it, it is a very good question. And when you go put it this way, if you if you write a paper, let's say I believe if you write a paper about Australia, okay. Uh, and I, uh, it will go to an Australian to review it. And he comes to me and I said, this person doesn't know what I live like. This is not how I live my life. It doesn't uh, mean anything. They've just done some analysis from their, uh, from their desk. They don't understand who we are. It's a straight rejection. So your professor is right um, in terms of picking, say, what, 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 what is a problem is some people just get some data. Oh, I've got the data. I'm going to run some regression and I'm going to write about it. So that is a problem, the approach that you take around it. So because you don't understand the problem, it's a straight rejection. You don't understand what you're talking about. But then the way that I, I do it is the following. You know, when I, I heard about Brexit, I was actually in um, um, uh, Trinity College in Dublin. 
And then I was right in the middle of everybody's discussion. Even the taxi driver was talking to me about Brexit. I was in Sweden um, for when it was happening. By the time I finished my European tour, I had understood everything about what is going on. And I also knew what they did not know. And but what they did not know is what, what I did was when I went back to Australia, Imad was still in Sweden and Hui, my PhD student, was in Vietnam. So I just coordinated this and I go, Hui, do your thing, which is run it, exactly what you, you would do. You run because you understand the data. Then you bring it to me. Because me and Imad was still in Europe, then I said, Imad, what's, uh, I'll write the first piece, send it to you, you tell me uh, what's going on. So then we, we sort of um, we sort of neutralize it with our knowledge of, of, um, of, of the market. But then, it, when, it, when it came down to, um, to, say, publishing on Europeans' environmental regulations, now that was a challenge. So Hui, for instance, uh, was doing his PhD, but I go to Politecnico di Milano a lot. I'm a, I'm a scholar there, and I go to Cologne, uh, Cologne University of Applied Sciences. So when I go and I meet my, my research associate, so we have a deeper understanding of what the problems are. So as long as one other person is aware of what is happening in this context, and you present when you go to these uh, to these network uh, networking events, and you talk to people, and you get an idea, then, well, we were ahead because uh, when Hui was doing his research in his PhD, he was reading about EU ETS as it was coming out. So then our knowledge was at par with the Europeans, and when we sat down and discussed, we go, oh, these guys know what they're talking about, so. Uh, they clearly, and they also know what Australia has done, so they've got uh, prior knowledge. Now they can see this as a follow-up, so they have the know-how. So there is the element of, of knowing um, what you're talking about that is uh, very, very important. Yeah. And the, the debate around, say, uh, um, uh, nuclear power, well, in Australia we are following the debate about nuclear power because where I live in South Australia, uh, we were having a debate around whether they should dump their nuclear waste and for treatment in South Australia and how far away it would be from my house and what sort of risk we are taking. Of course, we, had, um, we have a deep following up of what is going on with these regulations. So, it is, uh, to me, uh, it is not a matter of uh, pulling out data and then running it. No, it's a matter of knowing. And if you look at my Chinese paper that I publish, and I do publish a lot of Chinese paper, all my PhD students, not all, a lot of my PhD students come from China. So if I don't know the background, they do know. And if you think, you see that I publish on Mauritius. I was born in Mauritius, and I have all my friends at the University of Mauritius. So at least I've got somebody who's an inside out, who's an expert in this area. And soon you will see that I'll be publishing about uh, UAE and Dubai. And that's because now I, I, I am here on ground and I can see a number of things. And, and that, that, that is what you need to do, uh, Amberly. If you want to, to, to tackle this, that's the approach. Perhaps you should then start collaborating with people in, in, in these countries so that uh, you get to know what they know and there would be an exchange of knowledge between the two parties. Okay, thank you, sir. So I have a question closely connected with the English question. Actually, the these environment regulations are uh, motivated, politically motivated, and uh, the political parties uh, may be changed. The administration of the country may be changed after five year gap. So how can we conduct our research? Because after five years, some other political party uh, come into existence uh, into the power. So the political policies may be changed. Uh, so. The regulations uh, part also be changed, and some other new act will come into uh, take place of the other the previous uh, act which has been passed by the other government. So, uh, uh, what is the methodology in which we can conduct research based on the data? Because after every five year, the data uh, have a structural break. Okay, so let me let me share this with you. Okay, let me share. Uh, remember, I talked about this. Uh, wait. You ask me, okay. So you see this graph? At this point here, the government yes, coming, yeah. the government comes in yeah. and put a policy. And here, 
the government change. So they put another policy. So again, government in, government change. So each point yes. that you see here is now to, uh, to answer your question, where do you put your structural break? Well, CVC correction, okay? The dummy variable is like uh, doing a structural break. The dummy variable is capturing the structural breaks in the KPM, which is we put a structural break around the beta. Sorry, beta is here, okay? Uh, we put a, a that's so um, if the, this changes how beta is being changed, and if any one of these dummy variable changes, how this one is changing. So that's how we we put in um, we follow the changes that happens, and then we get this. So for me, when you say it's changing, and I'm thinking, oh my god, this is lovely. And if you go opposite, I can show uh, my diamond risk again, um, and I can show that it's something that works. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Dear sir, as you just uh, uh, told that you worked on uh, U.S.-China uh, war, you worked on Brexit. I just wanted to know whether any demo of any of your paper you can give us, how you collected and which econometric model you applied and uh, the source of uh, the information, like the data from where you collected and all. If the full paper you can demonstrate us, it would be quite uh, useful to us, sir. Thank you so much. Mm, okay. So let me let me open my file then. I'll have to look for a file. Okay. Well, do you want to see the paper? Or do you want me to hear talk? Because I can talk to you about them. Easy. Too easy. I can answer all the questions. So, okay. The way that I start, uh, let's say I'm doing Brexit. So all I need to do is to find out on the internet when was the first time we hear about Brexit. And then, this is publicly available information. With that in mind, I now look for every single uh, time that they made an announcement which is different on Brexit. So with that, I construct my table number one. Table number one becomes my event. Event number one, then I provide a brief description. So then, what I do next, I, I use event study methodology to start with. And while I was showing you my slides, I showed you event study methodology. You just have to take a return, which is a time series. You calculate the expected return. You calculate the abnormal return. And then on the day of the announcement, you put in your window of, say, 260 days, uh, which is 16 days after, sorry, and 240 days before. Okay, That is uh, your, um, your event study methodology. You calculate the t-statistics. And that gives you your abnormal return. Now, if you want to do a Corrado ranking, which is a robustness test, or the first robustness test is uh, you do um, removing firm specific information. Again, the way you do it, you go back to your portfolio, uh, you go into your window where you've, uh, 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 the event window, any firm that has got information on them, you take them Excuse out. Me. Of Please, because, because shall I interfere? Yes. So can yeah, yeah, please, please uh, turn on your video because the session is going to conclude. Please turn on your video. It's, it's oh, video? will be better. Yeah, I you can continue, my... but uh, you can turn on your video. Turn my video on. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm afraid if I turn my video, what will happen is um, the the ban would not be. You're not gonna hear me as much. You sure you want me to do that? Oh, okay. Okay. Fine. Sir. Yeah. So that's that's what we were experiencing as a problem uh, earlier. That's what I, I thought I, um, yeah. Um, I'll turn it and we, we can have a chat. Okay, so then um, if, you, if, if you remove your firm specific, it's just event study methodology, okay? I don't do any econometrics here. And then the, 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 the non-parametric tests, they are just statistical tests uh, where you convert the actual returns into a ranking system and then you do a non-parametric t-test, okay? And in, uh, in uh, uh, Chesney, it's one, it's running a tail distribution and point out which part of a tail it is. Now, when it comes down to uh, the, the, um, the risk model, that should uh, be just then. Now, that we need to Voice breaking issue. Use 
First, you have to check your choreogram to see if you have any uh, AR or ME terms that is causing it. Uh, you, you have to check your um, uh, correlation. Uh, you have to check for uh, arch effects. Uh, there's not much uh, heteroselasticity, but arch effects is our killer. Um, if you find autocorrelation, you have to correct it with the appropriate AR terms or ME terms. Uh, you run it. And if you have some arch effects, you have to uh, correct for it using some Gauch 1 1 model. That usually suffice. But then, you know, the family of Gauch is emerging to have E Gauch, Touch, blah, 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 Arch M. So you do all these additional tests and um, do them as robustness tests. And uh, that's all there is to it, uh, really. But you need to know how to do all of them. Yeah. And yeah. it's the same technique that I apply almost everywhere. Do share with us your papers if you can so that we can see and follow you, sir. Right. Uh, just give me one minute. I have to find my file. So, okay, so where are we search. Which one do you want? You want the Brexit? Brexit. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, we would like to uh, like you to introduce yourself before you ask the question. So we'll all get to know who's the speaker. Yeah, I'm Dr. Rupendra Katoj, Associate Professor, Lovely Professional University. Okay, so here is the paper. Okay. You want to see, we want to talk about table one. Probably table number one. Oh, table one doesn't have, okay, probably this one I didn't put the table because there's not many uh, observations in terms of the events that we, we show, but I will have to describe the event uh, somewhere. Okay, so here's a methodology. Daily returns, calculated, TI, okay. Um, that's the methodology. And I just rewrite it in this way, which is exactly what I was talking about. And then here I talk about the Corrado ranking, uh, the Chesney et al. Okay. And we correct for market uh, synchronicity. Uh, I talk about that in my presentation. Um, these are the variables, the dummy variable. I just talk about how we, we do them. And they take these forms, pretty much what I showed you uh, in, in, in there. And then how we run them. So the econometrics tools, like I was telling you, uh, you, you start with a child test just to see uh, if uh, you have any structural break. Then you do some redundant variable tests. This is just standard econometrics. I don't even talk about them. But the major ones are the arch AR terms and ME terms and your gauge effects. And that's, that's, uh, that's it. Um, and abnormal return, it's just abnormal return, KPM that we've used. And then these are the results. Uh, you get the banks. What sort of results do you get? And um, banks, okay. There's not much to talk about in terms of, um, let's see if I have a figure. No, I don't have any figure. Meaning that uh, uh, I didn't put too much emphasis on, um, the, I didn't find any um, uh, diamond risk in this one. It is a very, the reason why I got away with uh, uh, with this paper because we we submitted uh, the paper six weeks after Brexit was announced. Okay, there's not many information about it, and this paper got accepted in two weeks. Okay, so it was very quick because we moved quick and. There's not much, there's only probably one event or two events uh, in terms of uh, the uh, announcement of, uh, of, 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 uh, of Brexit, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. Okay, any, any other queries and any question? Professor Simon, you're on mute. It's muted. Professor Vigas, you made a very good presentation on uh, the and your work, the methodology, and uh, the way you went about in your research, basically in terms of sustainable finance. Uh, 
Uh, let me ask you uh, one question regarding, uh, suppose we look at a country like India, where in terms of environment or in terms of environment impact assessment, uh, regulations are not uh, what we call that very sound in terms of several sectors which we which are by and large unorganized. So when we go by the even study system or the even study methodology that we go about, uh, yes, we have we can have uh, solid data, uh, solid events in terms of investment in projects, uh, which are going to be things which are going to uh, support, uh, prevent the environment, use of best natural gas, things like that. But in terms of the impact that is happening due to this waste or pollutants or groundwater issues and things like that, uh, the data is not that forthcoming because uh, once the regulations are not that much in focus, obviously there are issues in terms of, uh, we do not know how much of uh, people have uh, how, how much is the cost of the damage that has been done? So in that case, uh, when you follow the uh, methodology of event management, yes, we have some some concrete data on investment that is going to neutralize or support sustainable finance or sustainable development. But we do not we are not getting that much of data pertaining to the the loss or the cost that has happened because of the damage it has been done to the environment or in terms of climate or in terms of pollution. So how does this methodology actually deal with uh, the cost part or the impact part where regulations are not that very tough? You have a very good question and I can answer the, uh, can answer you right away with a right answer, which I think yeah. event study methodology is not meant to, to do what you are you're trying to do with it and that is a very reality it, it will not fit so this is the wrong tool for this but i need to tell you something that we are currently working on so the right tool to use is cost benefit analysis that's where you can get it done and you will get your impact the way you want it yeah but we've integrated reporting coming in and we've uh, organizations having to report qualitative factors it is forcing me to look into how I merge these two together. Oh. At present, I have one PhD student working on it, and everything that we've tried has failed miserably. All our combination of ideas that we put together hasn't really gone very far. But the progress that we've made has been the following way. We have been able to get, say, um, uh, the in Australia, for instance, I'll give you an example. In Australia, the government has got a, a research house and they hire academics to do research in uh, in housing department. And in there, they have done all the cost and benefit analysis on, let's say, if you build a house, how much noise pollution you're going to make around this area. And they give you a dollar amount. And with that, now we can measure the amount of dollar invested and how much you, you, can, you can do in terms of pollution. We use... Um, um, uh, willingness to pay, YTP, to, to look at, say, uh, uh, parks. So we, 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 we've got all this covered. Now my last step is, how do I link it with event study? Uh, and I now have to think, what we are thinking about doing is, if I can calculate and estimate uh, the financial gain from event study, and then add it to there, that would be... That's how we are looking at it, but I can't talk more because it's we, we haven't made much progress on this thought as of yet. So because I can't tell you whether it's going to work or not. It should be a link between cost benefit as well as uh, the event study in that case. Yes, and guess what, uh, Professor Simon, I'm telling you, yeah. that's why I am forcing all of us to say, let's look at this because it's a real problem. And we've, we've, it's not linked right now. And these are the challenges that we should be looking into and trying to solve that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Anybody else wants to raise a question or add on or suggest something on the presentation? So in that case, if we have no more questions, can we, uh, uh, Biju, Dr. Biju, if it is okay, can we break for today and again come back tomorrow? And then I think Professor Vishak will be with us tomorrow and we can 
spend more time on this? Um, if we if we don't have any question any more questions, then I think we can wind up, sir. Did you, sir? Yes, sir. Tomorrow, tomorrow we can have more discussions. Tomorrow we will start uh, sharp six o'clock. Okay, that's too bad. Thanks, okay. guys. Thanks for listening, yeah. everybody. It was a pleasure. See you tomorrow. So, so thank you, Professor Vishak, and thank you. Good night. Who were with us? So before, um, be, before, yeah, unbelievable. Before we break. Yes, I'm uh, <laughs> But uh, for taking the time to. Share with us your. Experiences. It is definitely. So thank you, sir. Thank you so much for uh, bringing different frontiers of uh, for, for giving us uh, on how to search and how to uh, face. Ampli, your voice is breaking. Please check your. Voice. Thank you so much, sir. Today. Yeah, done with that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir, Vikas, sir. Good night. I'm sorry, I'm I, 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 I,